Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another of our Kirklees Library's Writer in Residence sessions. Today, we are celebrating Interfaith Week with Christina Longdon, our Writer in Residence, as she will be talking about her ancestor, Robert Rashid Stanley, and how she un unearthed her family history and her great great granddad's journey of faith. But first, we have Jude, a librarian with Kirklees Libraries, who would like to tell us a bit more about Interfaith Week and some of the events that are happening for it. So welcome, Jude. Hi, Nicola, and thank you very much. As Nicola said, my name's Jude. I'm one of the librarians for Kirklees Libraries. I'd like to say happy Interfaith Week to everyone who's watching, listening, whether it's live or recorded on Catch Up. So today's event with our wonderful writer in residence, Christina Longdon, is part of a number of events taking place in Kirklees for Interfaith Week. It started on the 8th of November and will be running right through to the Sunday, the 15th of November. And Interfaith Week, in case you weren't sure what it was, is about understanding and cooperation. It's open to those of all faiths and beliefs, including the non-religious. If you'd like to find out a bit more about Interfaith Week generally, you can go to this website, interfaithweek.org, and it tells you quite a lot about the history of Interfaith Week, about Interfaith Week now, and about what's happening throughout, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, <clears throat> throughout the UK, so what's happening throughout the UK. And here in Kirklees, we celebrate Interfaith Week every year. It's a special week to enable greater interaction between people of different backgrounds, helps develop integrated and neighbourly communities, and celebrates diversity and commonalities. It's a time to celebrate and build on the contribution that faith community members make to their neighbourhoods and society in general. Plus, it increases understanding between people of religious and non-religious beliefs. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what's happening in Kirky, please. So this year, despite the coronavirus pandemic, individuals, community groups and faith institutions have been working in partnership with Kirklees Council's cohesion team to plan a timetable of events. And today's event is part of that timetable of events. I'll just get a website up. It'll be able to tell you where you can go to find out what else is going on in Kirklees. So if you go to this site or if that's a bit too long and complicated to remember or write down, you can just go to Google and just Google Kirklees Together Interfaith Week 2020. It should take you there. You'll be able to click on the timetable of events and see what's going on. So Kirklees Libraries and Community Cohesion Team are working in partnership for today's events. Whoops. In the booklet, you'll find all sorts of different things that are going on. So a few examples that I've jotted down are an interfaith tree planting under the coordination of Dewsbury South community to highlight how the community works together. The secondary schools who are having question, interfaith question and answers um, and discussing lots to do with a bit like the question time that you might see on the BBC. So they're having those about question and answers about different faiths. And there's a virtual interfaith poetry session run by nearly famous or maybe famous Batley poets. And there's so much all so much else. So I would go and check it out. Plus, there's going to be some podcasts. I'll just get the Kirklees Together website up again. Plus, there's going to be some podcasts released as soon as possible, hopefully later today. You'll be able to find them on the Kirklees Council Facebook page and the, there'll be some links on the Kirklees Libraries page as web page as well. And now there'll be a number of podcasts talking about faith, including the experience and reflections of COVID-19 on faith communities. Hindu faith and experiences living in the UK and faith and experiences of working in a Catholic school. So if you'd like to know a little bit more and about the faith and um, interfaith week, do check out Kirklees Together and do Google Kirklees Together Interfaith Week 2020. And I shall move on very shortly. <clears throat> 
But I'll first of all just say that if you want to read up a little bit more about faith, beliefs, religions, <clears throat> you can find all sorts of ebooks, both factual and fiction, on our website. So do check those out for free. But I'm sure you're eager for me to hand over to wonderful writer in residence, Christina Longdon, who is our key person talking during Interfaith Week for our partnership event with Community Cohesion. So I'd like to welcome Christina. Hi, Hello. Christina. Hi. Just pull that banner off. Thank you for that just... lovely introduction. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. I'll just pop Nicola up into the stream as well. Mm -hmm. Hi, Nicola. Hello, Hello Chris. <laughs> okay. Right, I think we've got a presentation. To start we with. have. Oh, but yeah, Fantastic. So, we'll so I'm going to be leaving and I'll pop back a little bit later and just Thank keep going on the questions so we can have a chat about any questions that come in. Yeah, okay. brilliant. Thank you so Thank much. You. Looking forward to it. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay, Chris, I'll get your presentation. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Um, hi, everyone. Wow, there's lots going on and I really would recommend that you do as Drew suggested have a look at the other events going on there's lots going around the country um and there's no pressure on me at all today because I know there's people watching all around the country and there's people watching in various countries around the world as well so I've I do have rather an accent when I get excited and passionate and nervous about things so please forgive me if I go really broad because uh, that will happen inevitably as I get um, into the story um it is a story of one man's journey of faith but if you don't have a faith um you've got to stick with this and watch it because just to tell you a little bit about my own background i was born into a family where faith you know faith wasn't an issue my parents deliberately didn't have um, me and my brother christened because they felt it would be hypocritical to do that because uh, they didn't have a faith so why would they go and, and, and go to take a child to a church and make promises that they couldn't keep so that is really the context that this story was discovered within um there's another interesting faith angle which i'll talk about at the end which is quite astonishing and those of you that already know some of the story will, will understand why this story is so important and so exciting to our family now um but in itself this is a tale of a man a working class man a victorian man who was born before victoria um who was born into the uh, little family in the north of England and he had no formal education, he had no money and he never left this country. I think the most he ever did was travel to London and back maybe. Um, but it's an astonishing story about a man who was absolutely determined to educate himself, to be incredibly inquisitive and suspicious of the people that had the power and the money that he didn't respect. They had to earn their respect with Robert Stanley and you'll find out that that actually got him into a bit of hot water later on in his life. But he lived till he was 83 and there's 83 years I've got to pack in now so I've got to talk really fast. I'm doing another talk next week um, with Glossop Guild which is going to be two hours so if you're really interested to do have a check out of that one because obviously I can't go into all the detail of the research that I've done. So this is a story of family and faith and we're going to start off now if we can with the presentation Nicola. We're going to be talking about this man. Here he is. Here is, we've only got a couple of photographs of Robert Stanley, the hidden Victorian Muslim mayor as he's become known. There's a nice quote there from um, Baroness Saeed of Arsi who's read the book and um, was a big fan of it and a fantastic quote from the Quran which um, is quite a meaningful one to me and to my family as well. So that's Robert, one of the few photos that we've got of him. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please, Nicola. Thanks. This is a story of family history and it begins with my dad being made redundant um, a few years ago. He decided that he wanted to do more research into his family history. And we, you know, he'd always been interested in it over the years, but he'd never had the time. Uh, he was a lorry mechanic, you know, when he would come home from work, he was absolutely shattered. So he wasn't going to be going doing hardcore family research, but now he had the time to do it. And so he sort of threw the question out to, to the rest of the, the family. Does anybody know about his great, great grandfather, whose name was Robert Stanley? He believed he'd been a mayor of Stalebridge in the north of England, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, the, um, in a minute. And one relative came back with, um, said, I've got something on him that somebody's kept. And it was a small magazine, about this big, 
and it was called The Crescent. And the person that had published this magazine was called Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam. And the copy of the magazine was April 1907. And in it was a photograph of a man. And underneath it said, Brother Rashid Stanley, a very distinguished British Muslim. And we were all absolutely dumbfounded because, well, first of all, here is another photo of a man, not in the mayoral robes, but here he's sitting extremely distinguished. He's in what looked to be a quite unusual magazine, not the usual newspaper um, that we were used to looking at from, from that period in time. And a Muslim man, never heard of the word. I had no idea what a Muslim man was. Um, not the, the guys in the, in the circus acts, none of that. It's, um, it's basically a very archaic word for Muslim or Muslim, as it was written again. That's, that's an old fashioned way of writing the word Muslim. And the visual clue there is he's wearing a fez. Now, for me, a fez means to Tommy Cooper, you know, being the ignorant person that I am, I had no idea at the time what a fez represented. But luckily, we did have somebody in the family who we'll talk about later on, who knew exactly what this meant. Um, if you can move the slide on, please, now, Nicola. So that was an amazing artifact to have, and that unlocked really the secret and it was a secret I believe it was a secret that, that was kept by my family for 100 years for various reasons which I'll come at come to at the end of the presentation but that then led to the hunt and then my auntie got involved and she's a fantastic family historian um, and then uncle David got involved and, and soon everybody was trying to look for stuff what is this story with this Robert Stanley suddenly became a Muslim. What is that all about? Now, the problem is, any of you that are into your history, any of you that are into your family history, and especially if you're from a working class background, if you're from a working class background, there are very few artifacts. Unless you're as mad as I am and you like to keep everything and you're a hoarder, there's very few remaining hardcore bits of information, documents kept if you're working class. The obvious answer is most working class people, especially at this period in time, were far too busy, far too tired. They might not have literacy skills. They very often didn't possess the equipment to actually write down. Writing diaries and your recollections and your thoughts, that's stuff of the middle classes and the upper classes. I mean, who cares what working class people think? And that's why there was comparatively nothing on Robert Stanley. So the big passion of mine has been researching this and finding stuff and getting stuff. But the amazing thing was when my dad sent another shout out around the family, we found out this really strange information. There's this magazine, apparently became a Muslim. Another relative, a very close relative of Robert Stanley as we are, had a fez. And we couldn't believe this. He didn't know why he had it. He had no idea of the story, but he had kept this in an attic somewhere. And that was the fez that you've just seen in the photograph, Robert's fez. Now, my granny found this story out. Um, and again, this is her This is her great granddad. She'd, she'd never met him. Sorry, her granddad. She'd never met him. She'd heard about him. She'd definitely not heard that he's a Muslim. She heard no story other than, aren't we proud? He was the mayor of Stela Bridge. But after she died, my dad found this, the, the little brooch there, um, the start and crescent of Islam. And this this picture's gone all around the country to experts and we're pretty sure that this was given to him or this was part of his membership of the first mosque in in the country which again I'll talk about in a minute and all of a sudden things just started falling into place that really kicks me to go and do the research and to write the book because my dad and my auntie and my uncle and everybody was putting together this amazing story my dad wrote a pamphlet putting all the facts together and then a lot of my friends just kept asking more and more questions, but why, but why? So I thought I would write the book and I would write the context around it. So I went off to the archives and spent a long time at Thameside Archives, which is one of my most favorite places in the world. It, it's just fantastic. And I spent a lot of time because all of the information that I had to look at hadn't been kept by Robert, the written information. So much of it was in um, the old minutes, the old council minutes from when he was the mayor and from before he was the mayor. So for the first time ever, when I was in the archives in Ashton under line, that's when I saw his signature for the first time ever. It was quite emotional. Um, and again, you know, these amazing documents that I had to read totally ruined my eyesight. None of the newspapers, and if anybody from um, the British newspaper archives is watching, none of the newspapers from the most important place in the world which is southeast lancashire of the time and it was because this was king cotton 
Uh, none of them have been digitized. So I had to look at them on the old, you know, I couldn't word search Robert Stanley. I had to look at thousands and thousands of pages on an old fashioned microfiche. And yes, I did have to go to Specsavers at the end of it. So next slide, please. Now we're gonna be looking a little bit about, if you're not from the area, please get Google Maps out, whatever, whatever Googling choice of facility that you have and look up Staler Bridge, Ashton Underline, Hyde, Ducking Field. This is everything just west of Cookley's, where I'm sitting today in Huddersfield. Um, and the story begins there. Now, as I said, okay, I'm biased, but this really was one of the most important places in the world, Staler Bridge, had the first factories powered by steam to produce the cotton. So they were, it was really the first cotton town, Staler Bridge and Ashton. Now Manchester itself, because it's just a few miles away, they were an outgrowth of Manchester. And Manchester itself was, wasn't even referred to as Manchester at the time. All the newspapers in the world talked about King Cotton. People across the world knew King Cotton was Manchester. It's where the cotton was produced. And this is a, a classic photograph, absolutely love this. It was, you just couldn't move for the smog. You know, those those chimneys are still there. If you, if, you, if you visit these towns, a lot of the chimneys are still there. And this is where it just sprang up massively. This was the Industrial Revolution. This was right just after all the Luddites had been basically chased out of the land or hung. People who were seeing the factory system, the new beginnings of capitalism, families being herded into factories together you know the cottage industries were crushed you didn't have a choice you had to do it you had to feed your families you went into the cotton mills and Marx and Engels based a lot of what they wrote you know the communist manifesto the condition of the working the English working classes by, by Engels this was based very much on their observations of Manchester and of the outlying towns and if you read particularly Engels work you'll see that in comparison to Manchester the towns of state the bridge and Ashton and Duckingfield, he felt were way worse, the conditions there of the working classes. Here's a quote from it. No, this is Staler Bridge. Multitudes of courts, back lanes and remote nooks arise out of the confused way of building. Add to this the shocking filth and the repulsive effect of Staler Bridge, in spite of its pretty surroundings, may be readily imagined. Now, if I'd been there, I would have taken issue with him for being quite so rude about it. But I think, you know, he had he had a vision in mind. Let's face it, guys. So he was writing about these towns. He was trying to persuade people and tell people what was going on here. Um, Staler Bridge was infamous and it was infamous for, for a, a number of other reasons as well, which I'll come into now. So next slide, please. We're gonna dash over to Ashton. And Robert's been born. Robert was born in 1828. His mum and dad came from the Staler Bridge Duckingfield area and they went to Cardiff where they brought up their children. Robert was one of nine children. And he came back at the age of 10 to live with his dad's brother. Now his dad's brother was called John, John Stanley. So John Stanley, again, this is a working class family, but John Stanley became basically a millionaire, probably a billionaire by today's um, standards. And he was one of the key names in the industrial revolution in this area. He manufactured iron. What did iron make? All of the machines, the power looms. He built his wealth on growing capitalism. And of course, if you're in Cardiff and, and you're poor because the economy was crashing in the 1830s, you're gonna send your children off to be looked after a more, by a more wealthy relative. By all accounts, John Stanley was a very, very generous man. And we found that out through our joint family history research together. So Robert came up at the age of 10, left his family in Cardiff, and he came up to live in ashton under line really under the wing of Uncle John, although I think he put him in a tiny little pokey home down the road. Robert's older brother had already come up, so he basically kept an eye on him. Now, the context, now this is the bit that was the next astounding revelation. When my dad found out about Robert and he discovered he'd become a Muslim and he needed to go and find a little bit more basic information. And the first thing you do as a family historian is your birth, your death and your marriage certificate. So when dad got hold of Robert's marriage certificate to his wife, who was called Emma, Robert was 19 at the time. And my dad saw that he got married, not in a regular church, in a place called the Sanctuary of the Christian Israelites. Now, if you're from that side of the world, or if you're really into the, this kind of history, you might have heard of the Christian Israelites. If you haven't, and if you don't know about them, I'll spend a couple of minutes explaining. Now, the Christian Israelites were what is called a millennialist sect. They believed 
that the Messiah was going to return very soon. And it was Prophet John Rowe who was referred to as the Prophet. John Rowe was a Bradford lad. He was a wool comber. Don't forget, if you're from if you're from Yorkshire, it's wool on that side of the Pennines, and if you're from Lancashire, it's cotton production on that side, on the other side of the Pennines. So John Rowe's background was in wool, and just before John Rowe set up the Christian Israelites, the backstory is a woman named Joanna Southcott. Now Joanna Southcott was a leader, very unusual in the Victorian times, a, a female leader. Uh, Prior to the Industrial Revolution, and there's probably a number of reasons for this, there were a lot more female leaders of Christian sects. Once we saw capitalism um, entering, the, um, basically exploding across the world, women were more and more pushed out as religious leaders and shut up and shut down and locked up and all kinds of hor horrific things happened to women. But before this, we had quite a few strong female leaders, and one of them was Joanna, an amazing, astounding person in her own right who had visions and prophecies and revelations. She had a huge following. The people that followed her were called the South Cotnians, and there was a massive leadership battle once she died. Again, I won't go into the whole, I could talk forever about the Christian Israelites and Joanna Southcott, but once she died, there was a huge leadership battle by the men. Many men who were having prophecies and visions, and the one that came forward was John Rowe from Bradford. And for some reason, he decided that Ashton was the place. There was already a very strong and growing group of South Cotians in Ashton. There was in Bradford, there was in Huddersfield and other pockets across the country, Gravesend in Kent in particular, down towards the west of the Midlands. But John Rowe decided Ashton is the place I am going to go. So this is just before our Robert was born. And he decided that the Messiah would be born and would be born in Ashton Underline. So he was going to build the New Jerusalem and he physically started building the New Jerusalem. He built four gatehouses and he was going to carry on joining up the city walls around Ashton. I do not know what the people of Ashton thought about this. It must have been very bizarre to be told that the Messiah was going to be born there. But this was a different age and people were desperately hoping for something. And the conditions, as, you, as you've been told about already, were just horrendous. Roe obviously saw that this was a great place to grow his group. And he obviously felt that there were people there that needed his message. He had amazing prophecies, amazing visions. Um, his prophecies all seemed to come true. And he was an incredibly charismatic personality. Now, he became friends with three of the richest men in Ashton. I'm not going to put any judgments on this because the whole part of me writing this book was John Rose, Life and Times. Everybody's hooked into the scandal that happened. and for whatever reason, the cast him as this charlatan figure. I will let you decide that yourself if you want to go up and read about it. But basically, John Stanley became second in command to John Raw. And Auntie Sarah Stanley, Robert's Auntie Sarah, also played a part in, in the story, which there still isn't time to talk about this today. Now, just before Robert arrived in Ashton at the age of 10, something called the Seven Virgins Scandal happened. Now, some of you might well have seen um, TV series um, starring Kathy Burke, Jonathan Price, a very young mini driver back in the 90s, which was entirely based on this story where John Rowe was accused of sexual impropriety. He'd apparently taken seven young handmaids uh, to see to, to look after him and he was accused of various things. Um, he was acquitted, there was a church hearing, there was never um, a legal hearing, he was never prosecuted or anything, but this is Ashton and there's a political background which I'll talk about in a minute. Radicalism, political radicalism, anger at the system, the oppression of the in increasing numbers of police on the streets and the fact that the government were watching this area because it was seen to be an area ripe for revolution because of the discontent of the working classes. On two occasions, the sanctuary here, which you can see in the photograph, which was bankrolled by John Stanley, which is why I don't have any money, because all our money went into building this sanctuary and these gatehouses. Um, it was attacked by the people of Ashton once this scandal had hit the press, because this hit the national press and the Christian Israelites were, were beaten up. They nearly killed Roe on two occasions. And good old Uncle John had actually built two tunnels, which nobody knew about, two secret tunnels under the sanctuary across to his 
home on the other side of the road in Ashton, where the Asda is. If any of you know Ashton, it's, that's where it is. Uh, and, this, and the tunnels went under the road. And on two occasions, when the people attacked it and completely trashed the sanctuary, the Christian Israelites escaped. Um, there's a picture up there in the right-hand corner. That's John Rowe. Now, I'll just quickly ex explain the beliefs of the Christian Israelites. John Rowe decided to extend um, the, the beliefs of the Christian Israelites. He wanted to go back to Mosaic law. So in many ways, the Christian Israelites were closer to the Jewish faith than they were to the Christian faith. They were, they were an interesting mix of both. So he said that anybody who was a Christian Israelite had to follow Mosaic law. So it was stuff like they had to wear certain clothes without seams, um, you know, the, the Jewish Sabbath. Everybody had to eat kosher food. And Uncle John Stanley set up two shops where you could buy your kosher food from in Ashton because, you know, there were there were no Jews. There wasn't there was nobody other than white people in National Sailor Bridge at the time. If they were, there were very few records. You could go into Manchester, it was a lot more cosmopolitan and mixed, but John Rowe wanted to have the kosher food available. So there were all kinds of rules. You were not allowed to have a living image displayed. That's why there's no photographs of Christian Israelites. Christian Israelites would not pose for photographs. Probably even that picture there was, would, would be a bit out of order. So he imposed all of these rules. And another rule, which many of you will be familiar with, all the men, the babies, the boys, anybody who joined the Christian Israelites had to be circumcised. Now, Robert had obviously decided to join the Christian Israelites because he got married there. Now, it might well be that he did it as a thank you to Uncle John for helping him on in his life. We don't know. But basically, I think that this was the grounding of his faith. This is how it all began. His grounding of interest in Jew Jewish religion and the coming of the Christ. Thanks. Next slide, please. So here's the political context. And again, when we're talking about faith, it isn't all about spiritual beliefs. It's about what drives your belief? What is your faith system? Where do you want to see justice? And how do you want to see justice? And who will deliver justice? And I think that was a key theme in Robert's life. Where is this going to come from? Now, he married Emma at the age of 19. I don't know whether Emma was a, me a member of the Christian Israelites or not. All that we know was he was working in the shop for his uncle John from the age of 10. She was a domestic servant in Hyde and they met somehow. We don't know. He then on his marriage was gifted a shop. Now, this is amazing because, you know, you can't afford to buy a shop if you're working class. Uncle John clearly decided Robert was great at what he did on his wedding day. I'm going to give him a shop and the shop is in nearby Stalebridge, just on the train line, really. And Robert decided because Uncle John had also had, had been a tea trader that he was going to go into the tea trade. Now, just moving back again, I'm, I meant to say one of the big rules of the Christian Israelites was that all the men had to wear beards. Now, if you were rich, like Uncle John, you had to pay a tax. And the tax was the privilege of not wearing a beard, because at this time before the Crimean War, beards were not cool. You did not have a beard. They were just really gross. In fact, the Christian Israelites were criticised and ridiculed and were called the beardies. Uncle John didn't have a beard because he had to go into Manchester to trade on the floor of the old corn exchange and he would not have been allowed and he would have had a very bad reputation if he'd wandered in with a big bushy beard like the Christian Israelites had. So this is the context anyway. We had Peterloo, which I'm sure you all know about, 1819. We had the Luddites in the area. In the 1830s, we had the most violent strikes, murders. Um, of factory owners, chartism, which was the cry for democracy, which, which was basically the vote for the working classes, proper representation. Well, at this point in history, the only people that could vote were the landed gentry and a few middle class people and certainly no women. Factory reform. People were desperate to stop this horrific system of children going down the mines in the factories for 12, 13, 14 hours a day. And the poor law, which was herding people who'd fallen on hard times into workhouses. I'm sure you all know about Oliver Twist. And that was that's that book was very much born from this period in history. Thanks. Next slide, please. So Robert has a Christian Israelite background. He comes to live in Staler Bridge. And then, oh, again, this is piecing all of the information together. And this is what I found out. We suspected because his, his, his burial later on in life, which, which I'll, I'll talk about, was a Christian in a Christian graveyard, we suspected that he might be along to St George's. When he arrived in Stalebridge, there had been a massive 
battle, not a physical battle, although it did happen at one time. There were two St. George's in Staley Bridge. There was the old St. George's, which was the original parish church, the Church of England or Anglican Church of the town. And then a few decades later, the Church of England decided that a new church would have to be built. And I won't go into that. I'll talk about that next week on the Talking Glossop. So there ended up with being two St. George's and they ended up with two rival vicars. There was something that was went on for several years. The old St. George's, they were not allowed to practice services there, but that was the popular church with people. People wanted to go to that one. They didn't want to go to the new one. The new one was stationed near the soldiers' barracks, so it was full of soldiers, and people just wanted to go to the old one. Um, it got to the stage where the church at Old St. George's was being barricaded every day and the doors and the locks kept getting changed. Hundreds of people were turning up in the graveyard every morning, waiting to see the vicar from New St. George's, who was determined to preach at Old St. George's, arrive. Um, it was, you know, there wasn't TV in those days. The best thing was to go and watch the church and see the vicar shouting each other. This went on for months. This became a huge court, uh, a legal trial as well. And at one point, you know, shots were fired, the wardens were attacked. This is the context to Robert arriving in Staley Bridge. This is what was going on in the Christian community at the time. He actually decided, and I found this out through the newspaper um, articles that I was looking at, he decided to start attending Old St George's. So he then switched from the Christian Israelite background to an Anglican traditional Church of England background. Um, I suspect the reason for that was well, he might have liked the church, he might have liked the service, he might have liked the singing. But I suspect the reason was he was a man with ambition. OK, he was working class. He had no formal education. He was an avid reader and writer. His, his literacy skills were fantastic. The only way to get on in society at this time and to get into politics, which is what I suspect he wanted to do, was to join the Church of England. You know, you could become a Methodist, you could become another, um, you could start attending a different church. But this was the Church of Queen and Country. You know, this was the established church. So it, if he was here today, he might disagree with me completely. But I get the feeling that this was a church to belong to if he wanted to, to get on and move on in society. Right. Thanks, Nicola. So the next slide is about the Lancashire cotton famine and again I can talk about this forever. I knew nothing about this growing up um, I knew I learned nothing about it at school. Many people who are older than me also knew nothing about it but it was one of the things that struck me most of all. This was 43 years after Peterloo. On the left hand side is an illustration because there were no photographs but then an illustration in the national newspapers of what happened in Staley Bridge as a result of the Lancashire cotton famine. The Lancashire cotton famine basically happened because President Lincoln over in the USA had to stop the economic might of the South in order to win the Civil War and in order to crush slavery and to end it. The only way he could do that was by stopping cotton from getting up to Manchester and to Staley Bridge. So for several years, these Lancashire cotton mills, most of them had to shut. So we're talking in Staley Bridge in Ashton, 70 to 80 percent of, of hundreds of mills and thousands and thousands of people, no jobs for two or three years. No jobs. There's no dole. There's no benefits. There's, there's the workhouse, if you look at it. Uh, but most people were starving, literally starving to death. And it was called the Great Panic because some of these towns just became ghost towns. People had to leave and look for work. But as a result of the Lancashire cotton famine in Manchester, who set the poor rate, the poor law rate for Staley Bridge, they said that the unemployment rate was so high they couldn't give any more aid to Staley Bridge and to Ashton. So they were going to give out food tickets instead. If any of you have ever been unemployed and have been faced with this kind of situation, you know how demeaning it is to be told you can't be trusted with money. We'll give you a ticket. You can get a free meal. It's, you know, it's just this is a story for today. If you're political, the people rioted, basically, and they attacked the shops. And my dad had a copy of the newspaper which was Robert Stanley's. Now, Robert had not written on this newspaper. He hadn't written anything. Robert didn't write anything down for us. We had to we had to look it all up ourselves. But it was intriguing to me. Why on earth, why on earth had somebody from our family kept this newspaper? So what me and my dad did, we got the census for that year for 1861, and we knew that Robert had his shop in Sailor Bridge in this area. So one Sunday morning, we had a stroll down Melbourne Street in Sailor Bridge, and we looked up which was his exact shop 
And there they are on the photograph on the right. That's my dad and my little boy, as he was then, standing outside the shop. Now, if you look back to the illustration on the other side, you'll see that that shop is being attacked. That shop is having chests thrown out of it. And it also says tea at the top of it, Canton Tea Company, which is still in existence, amazingly. This is Robert's shop. So Robert's shop was attacked during the bread riots. The, the reason it's called the bread riots is because the shopkeepers, in order to stop their shops being burnt down, because the poor law stores, which were just opposite Robert's, um, were set on, set on fire. They, they had all the, they, basically, the, the clothes that you had to wear were poor law clothes. He had a big stamp on them that said, I'm a poor law child, you know, I, these clothes are from the poor law store. Um, and they were worried that their businesses were going to get set on fire in the riot. So they were throwing breads out. That, and that's the only oral memory that has been passed down through Robert. Robert told his sons, and his, one of the few of his sons were there. Um, we remember throwing the bread out the windows to stop the people from burning the place down. So isn't that amazing? That That's what the census does, and that's what family history can do for you. Um, putting those two photographs together, we think that that's, that's one of the things that sort of fast-tracked Robert into politics. He was already um, being asked to chair debates, I found this in the newspapers, about the American Civil War and slavery and, and events going on around the world. Straight after this, he became a local councillor. Um, and again, you know, local councillors were not paid at this point in time. Um, local politicians were all extremely wealthy, upper-class people that basically ran these towns. And Robert? The grocer from the end of the street was asked to become a councillor. Then he was asked to become a magistrate. Again, you know, he had he had 11 kids, you know, 11 kids um, and he moved further down uh, the street. So he was an even smaller, smaller shop. 11 kids in one shop, asked to be a councillor, asked to be a magistrate. There must have been something about him. He must have had some considerable intelligence or, or sense of justice or, or perception. And the more I dug, the more I looked into this, the more I was convinced that he'd been asked because of his stance during the bread riots and his level headedness, if you like. Thanks. Next slide, please, Nicola. So this is just to, uh, to, um, to illustrate, perhaps, during this period, I've already talked about the Battle of the Two St. Georges. Joseph Raynard Stevens, which I love to do talks as well, he was an amazing champion of the working class. He was a Wesleyan Methodist minister who left the Wesleyan Methodist Church because he disagreed um, with their whole take on having an established church. Um, he was crying out for factory reform. He felt that it should be reduced to a 10-hour days. There's wonderful photograph of a little boy working 12, 13, 14 hour days. He was against the poor law. He was the local hero and he was famous throughout the land and he was actually sent to prison for 18 months. Apparently somebody said that he'd said to the working class people at a massive big rally to take up arms against the government because he was sick and tired of the oppression of the poor. Um, the other issue as well that that there would be somebody like Joseph Brainer Stevens, who I had a gut feeling Robert must surely know. And finally, I found some evidence that they knew each other and they were friends. And Joseph Brainer Stevens thought very, very highly of Robert. Um, the other issue that would have been rumbling on from the Christian side of things was there was massive sectarianism in these towns, very much, very much like Liverpool. There was a huge number of, of Roman Catholics living in the town. And during the 1860s, the population increased from something like 5% to nearly 50% of newly arrived Irish immigrants. Just within the space of a year, immigration was massive and anti-Catholicism was huge. So much so that in 1868, across the land, a guy called William Murphy, who was the most horrific bigot who came to Britain to, to, to deliberately cause violence against Catholics and to criticise the Roman Catholic Church, coming out with the most lewd and horrible stories and preying on people's insecurities, exploded in riots across the country, but the most protracted were in Stalebridge and in Ashton whilst Robert was there running his shop. And he would have seen all of this going on. Right, next slide, please. So he became a councillor. He was a conservative, I know. This shocked my family for several reasons. Half of the family were conservative. We won't go into politics. But anyway, most people feel that if you're working class, you labour. Now, the last few years, that's kind of turned on its head quite a bit. But the original party of the working the working people was the Tory party. They were the, the party of the working. The Liberals were very much reflective of the middle class, the educated, you know, um, and the working class were were. The working class 
nearly always followed the Tories. So, so as soon as Staley Bridge and Ashton were allowed to have MPs, you know, it was pretty much odds on that the Tories were going to do well out of it. He was a Tory. This is way before we had the Labour Party, for example. Um, so in his lifetime, you were either Conservative or you were Liberal. That was it. He was a magistrate. He sat on a school board because during the 1870s, children... Is there any children watching this? I'm sorry, but you had to start going to school. That was a law. And Robert was there to enforce those laws that parents take their children to school. And there's all kinds of funny tales that I read in, in newspapers about when, when he had to sort of come down quite hard on parents. Parents were saying stuff like they do today. He just walks off in the other direction. <laughs> what does that sound like? My life. Um, he was also, and this is fascinating, he was an expert witness to Parliament in 1869. Now, as I've said before, the working class man, I keep saying man because women were not even considered, had no vote. And when they did vote, um, the few that could vote were ones that owned property. Now, the vast majority of working class people didn't own property. They rented. They couldn't afford to buy a property. The ones that did have a little bit of property, maybe, you know, 20 or 30 in a town, they had to go and vote alongside the middle class people. And they had to put their mark on a big blackboard in the middle of the market ground with thousands of people watching you. Now, because there were so few votes and it was so marginal, the factory owners, who were most the Liberals, were desperate to get their candidates onto the council or elected as MP. So there was a bribing and a treating system going on, which the government had to do an investigation into. And Robert, who was a magistrate at the time, was the expert on how working class people, the very few, because you know it, it was, this was marginal voting, it was important voting, they were basically bribed um, or they were treated, which is take them down the pub, get them drunk, they'll vote for us, we'll get you drunk again next week, or they were beaten up very badly. So Robert went to Parliament and gave evidence on this, and they wanted his opinion on whether he felt that the secret ballot should be introduced in order to protect this vote, so nobody would know what you were voting. That was introduced a few years later. Thank you. Next slide. Pontifract. That's where the first secret ballot took place, folks. So then he became the mayor. So we're climbing and climbing and climbing. He's still living in the tea shop. He's still a tea trader. He's a mayor. He gets some money for being a mayor. His entire role at this point in life was about keeping people calm. And he was very much into the whole social social municipal movement. So if you've heard about a municipal socialism, it isn't, it isn't to do with socialism. It's to, it's to do with the fact that the public health needed improving. People needed safe places to shop, clean water. So he built, he was he, he was a person that headed up the building of Stale Bridge Market Hall, for example, and um, Dustone's Reservoir, which I'm sure many of you visited, very beautiful. Stanford Park, um, he was one of the original trustees of the beautiful Stanford Park in Stale Bridge and Ashton. Thank you. Next slide, please. So... He's juggling home. He's getting more and more involved in local and national politics. He meets David Urquhart. This is back when he was a younger man in his 20s, 30s, we think. He said he met David Urquhart, who was a British diplomat. And this is stuff that I found out that I had no idea about at all. Um, the whole the whole international um, politics was of huge interest to him at this point. And again, no written records about this. I had to put it all together. He, David Urquhart was pro Turkish. He was pro-Ottoman Empire. He'd been sent out there for the, on, on behalf of the government, basically to spy on what the, the caliph uh, what was doing, what the sultan was doing. And he came back going, wow, actually, these people are great. I'm really impressed with them. And the public health system is fantastic. And we should intrude, we should introduce Turkish baths. And Robert obviously became a bit of a follower and a bit of a fan of David Urquhart after meeting him. And he became more and more interested in issues such as Crimea and in Ireland and, and India, the, the, all of the international stuff that was going on there at the time. He must have read so much in the newspapers on this and educated himself. He was very interested in the Balkans and he was extremely suspicious of Russia. Um, and in 1876, in the final year of, of his, his mayoral role, he got himself into a bit of hot water because there was a massacre of Christians in Bulgaria by the Ottoman army. And uh, Gladstone, who basically um, Robert absolutely loathed, said that everybody should be having meetings across the land to condemn this atrocity, to condemn this atrocity. And Robert said, no, procedures have been put in place to stop this from happening again. I'm not going to call a meeting because this is just an excuse for you to use this as a political tool. And because of this, the well healed people of the town, the rich guys, completely turned against him. And I think it was very much a, a matter of who does he think he is, you know, telling us what to do. He's got a call a meeting. This is outrageous. And he was basically saying, yes, it is outrageous. We don't need a meeting. 
So then he decided not to be a mayor, and this is a fun bit, he went off to own a pub, the new inn in Ashton, which is still there, near Thameside Hospital, and he was a publican for 18 years. Next slide, please. Then he went to Russia, to Manchester. This is the block of houses that he lived in. And so we're looking at Robert now at the age of 69. He's had a long and interesting life. And I had a gut feeling because I've been doing a bit of reading about um, certain people that lived in this area of Manchester. And I got my great, great, great granny's birth certificate, Robert's wife, Emma. They died. They had wonderful married life together, I think, because they lasted the course anyway. Um, they, had, uh, they had the golden anniversary. And here is Emmeline Pankhurst, who lived around the corner from Robert, signed the death certificate of, of Emma. So they would have met um, again. You know, he's never left any records of what he thought of Emmeline Pankhurst at the time. But that's quite interesting. This is a very interesting corner of, of Manchester with the Gaskells and the Pankhursts. Right, next slide, please. So this is the bit. We know he becomes a Muslim. We know he becomes a Muslim in 1898, thanks to that little newspaper article from the Crescent at the beginning. In that, he was interviewed by the man that wrote this newspaper, who was called William Abdullah Quilliam, a convert, probably the most famous convert to Islam in the UK, who was originally born as William Quilliam and became Abdullah Quilliam. In that, he told William Abdullah Quilliam that he'd met David Urquhart, that he'd been impressed with the, the Ottoman Empire's interests, that he was very suspicious of Br Russia and Britain's role, he was very suspicious of what Britain was doing in terms of its empire and, and the way it was treating people within the empire. He told Quilliam that he'd lobbied the government on foreign policy, on the treatment of Muslims who lived in Balkans, Armenia, Afghanistan and Bulgaria. He even said, and this is the best bit, he even said, I've been corresponding with the Sultan, I've been advising him on the Quran because I feel very much that how can anybody understand the Quran if there isn't a proper English translation that isn't written by Christians? Because until this point, it's only Christians who've done a translation from Arabic um, to, to English for the Quran. And he, he'd written to the Sultan before he became a Muslim saying, I want to read this book. I don't trust that Christians are going to give me, you know, the actual, the truth, what this book's about. He wrote to him about trade and manufacturing and about agriculture. He was advising him on getting more and more people into the military schools. And the interesting thing was the Sultan took all of this on board. And the, the funny bit for me was he's writing to him from the pub in Ashton, <laughs> this guy that owns a pub advising the Sultan. And just an incredible um, little story there. And he was, he was very much obviously somebody that influenced parliamentary reform and, and working class voting rights and the procedures that, that, you know, that happened after this period in time. That's a little um, picture up at the top of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who was the caliph um, at the time, the, the one that Robert was writing to. Next slide, please. So. He became a Muslim on the 22nd of April 1898. He said Shahada, which is a statement that you say when you become a Muslim, in the presence of Quilliam. Quilliam was appointed as Sheikh al Islam of the British Isles, so that the head person of Islam in the British Isles. He was very good friends with the Caliph. He visited the Caliph in Constantinople and he set up the first mosque. Britain's first mosque was in Liverpool. Not many people know that. And you can still visit it today. It's a beautiful, wonderful building that's being restored to the way it was. It's in, it's in a group of terraced houses. It was, it was, you got to visit it. Fab. So he became a key person in the Liverpool convert community. He was appointed vice chairman of the mosque and he was always at the top of the table whenever a foreign dignitary or a a member of royalty visited. So he was thought of very highly by Quilliam. It was 28 years younger than him. Clearly something about Robert that impressed Quilliam. Next slide, please. Now this is again an amazing discovery because right there at the back, Quilliam is the guy on the right in the white. And that's a fantastic example of I guess the different ethnicities that attended the mosque at the time, bear in mind, you know, Liverpool shipping port, a lot of people from around the world would have been practicing the Islamic faith. Where do you go to pray? There's a mosque in Liverpool. It must have been a fantastic discovery for them. And, and a friend noticed this picture and recognized from my own pictures of Robert, that's him there, right at the back, the old guy with the fez praying behind the sheikh. Um, and there's just some examples there of Robert's wonderful literary skills, which I won't read out to you because I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this. But these are the letters that Robert wrote to the prime minister. He was very sarcastic, fantastic sense of humour about what the prime minister, prime minister was up to. And he wrote letters to every newspaper under the sun. He was a consummate letter writer. 
So next slide, please. We're nearing the end now. This is the house that Robert died in. Quilliam had to leave the country. At this point, just before, I suppose about the turn of the century, the Liverpool convert community were coming under surveillance by the British government because we're edging closer and closer towards Germany and Turkey alliance and World War One breaking out. Quilliam had to flee the country. He went to Constantinople to get to be basically under the safety and um, under the guardianship of the Sultan. Robert returned to Staler Bridge. And this is the little house he lived in, still there, Wakefield Road in Staler Bridge. And my dad found his grave. Just as my dad embarked on this, he found his grave. So that's his grave. His grave is in St Paul's Church, which is the posh end of Staler Bridge. Um, and that's the family grave. But only a couple of weeks later, after taking this photograph, the grave was destroyed um, because they were building a new car park for the church. And despite us pleading to save the grave, we were told that we'd not applied early enough to, to keep the headstone, which is what we wanted to do. So that's very sad, but at least we saw where it was and his body's still there, we think. Um, and we've got a photograph of it and we remember him in our own ways. Anyway, next slide, please. So what we think is bearing in mind, going right back to the start, we, we don't know because my granny, after the, this discovery, I asked her many times, did you not know anything? Do you not know any of this story? And she said, no, all that I knew was he was a retrobite. Now, I'd never heard of that term. Um, Retrobite is basically somebody who practices temperance. William Quilliam, before he converted to Islam, was a member of the temperance movement. And, and that was an incredibly popular um, social movement at the time. So I'm not sure he did this when he owned the pub. He might have done. You never know. But he, but the, the narrative is, let's not talk about him being a Muslim because that's a little bit odd. And World War One's just broken out and they've kind of sided. You know, the Ottomans have sided with the Germans. They're the enemy. On the left, that's um, some of Robert's children. Again, they haven't handed down this story about Robert. We've had to find it out um, ourselves. So World War One broke out. There were plenty of Islamophobic attacks on Liverpool Mosque. Robert would have been a person of intelligence under surveillance, as Quilliam was, and the other well-known converts were. Um, and on the right, that's my grandpa. Remember him very well. That's my grandpa in mourning dress for Robert. Um, and his wife there, Bertha, um, her brother married into the T.E. Lawrence family, Lawrence of Arabia. So again, you know, we've got one side of the family that are out there fighting the Turks and the other side that are going, let's not talk about that because we were friends. And we think we can only, we've only got supposition going on here, but yeah, it, that's probably why it was covered up. Right, next question, next um, slide, please. This is my family today. And this is the amazing thing, um, right there in the middle is my big brother. And he was the one that virtually fell over when, when we made this discovery because he had converted to Islam himself in 1990, a long time before um, any of us knew anything about Robert and this secret in the family. And it was absolutely astonishing for him because he, you know, he just thought he was the only white working class person who'd ever converted to Islam in Manchester. But no, his great, great, great grandfather had done it 100 years before him. And that's our family visiting the, the mosque in Liverpool. Next slide, please. This is just an example of some of the reactions we've had from all around the world to this story. Um, if you can read that, um, it's, it's on the Robert Rashid website anyway. This is a wonderful, wonderful young man who came to one of the talks and he was so angry and so upset at what happened to the gravestone. He decided to write a poem. And it's such a great, I can't do poems. I'm a writer in residence, I can't do poems. And it's such a beautiful, wonderful poem in memory of Robert. And he put it up on a little gravestone there and sent it to us, um, which was just the most beautiful, beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you if you're watching this. <laughs> That's Mohammed Amin. Next slide, please. So I wrote two books, as you do, just knocked it out. One is the historical biography. So it's all the research that I've done. There's way, 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 way more than I could ever talk about in this talk. And the other one is, because I like fiction, is my, my all those questions, all those gaps. What would his wife have thought? What would his daughters have thought? What would his, you know, what did people think? Did they treat him badly? I put it into Imagining Robert. I just imagined those bits that you might have questions about um, that are going on in your head. Um, it's very hard. And it was, it was difficult for me to write that because I kept thinking, oh, you know, I don't want to be disloyal to his memory. But you know what? I don't think I was. I think I just 
did some guesstimates and then the factual stuff on the other one so lots of talks happening um obviously under lockdown they're, they're kind of virtual on the online you can get the books from amazon um but if you don't like amazon you don't want to do amazon the cube k-u-b-e if you look them up they also sell the books and they're a fantastic um publishing house as well uh, and as i said next week i'm, I'm doing a longer talking gloss up road going into it into a little bit more detail so thank you i'll leave it there because we still want some time for questions if anybody has any thank you i need a drink now <laughs> Wow, Christine, <laughs> that was so great to hear all that. And this is the second time I've heard talk. Oh, you. <laughs> no, but it's just, it never gets boring. And I always learn something new. So I just wanted to say that to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I, it's always just so engaging and so great to hear. <clears throat> I don't know what's happening with my voice today, so I, I do apologise. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> I'm just going to shout out one comment that we've received. We've received quite a few questions. We've got some things to chat on, on Facebook, etc. But we've just got great lecture. Thanks. <laughs> I oh, thought I'd share that. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. I'm sure there's lots of other people Thank saying you. that. We've got um, Olivia says thanks oh. christina this has been a fantastic session really interesting love that your brother did the same without knowing he'd been beaten to it <laughs> one thing i should say as well um on that point olivia my when, when my brother had his first son um isa isa was named after robert rashid so he's called isa robert rashid which and he was on the photographs there but yeah that, that's nice isn't it? you've got to carry on the family names yeah absolutely oh, it's such a lovely connection isn't it for mm -hmm. people through history um we've got susan wildman's just sent in that was fascinating christine <laughs> so wonderful <laughs> now we have got um a couple of questions if you've got time because yeah, if you've, you've got, got time i've got time <clears throat> yeah we've always got time but um, <laughs> actually, yeah, i'm saying that but i'll be on for hours if i'm not careful <laughs> good um, so going quite a bit back into the talk We've got Alan Taylor, who's asked on Facebook, where in Ashton was the sanctuary? Okay, right. <coughs> it's not. It's obviously the sanctuary isn't there anymore. But the original old post office, not the original, the, the more modern uh, post office building. Um, it's 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 where the old post office building was. So if you think about um, st top end of Stamford Street, where the big roundabout is, where the Church of the Nazarene is, if you went as a crow flies. Um, back over there towards the Asda side, it, it was there on on that street there at the back where the post office building was. Wow, thank you. I wish they'd kept it. <laughs> it used to be the Star Cinema. Um, you know, I'm sure there will, there will be people watching this of that age group who might even remember that it being the Star Cinema in Ashton. Wow, amazing. And we have um, Susan Wildman says that she's been inside one of the Christian Israelite buildings as a young journalist so i think there might be a connection up there with you so yeah, the, the, well, still the printing <coughs> press is still there the original printing press on richmond street i think it is oh. um is, is one of the few existing buildings that you can go and have a nose at if you're interested oh, wow so there might be a conversation there to be had at a later date yeah. <laughs> um yeah brian longdon says the sanctuary was on church street um, I don't know who this Brian Longdon person is. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Oh, Thank sorry. you, Dad. <laughs> For a minute, I think I'm a bit slow today. He knows his stuff. Okay, that's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, we should invite him in definitely. And we've got <laughs> Ibrahim. Ibrahim Carla says, "Never ceases to amaze me." Oh, thank you. Know. Isn't that lovely? Everybody is sending the comments in. So that's lovely, yeah. Made me day. <laughs> we'll jump on to a couple of questions. So the first one, what was the climate regarding converting from a faith to another faith at the time? Because looking at the sort of story of Robert, he it looks like he's he's shifted around a little bit with faith before he converted to being a Muslim. Yeah. So I felt that was a, a very interesting question. It is. I mean, I'm not an expert on conversion. There are people out there who that's the bread and butter being an expert on conversion but at this time in particular with regards to the islamic faith it was very much seen to be something that middle class 
it was a middle class thing that you'd, you tended to do. That's I mean, obviously we've got their narratives more than we have the working. There were working class converts, but we don't have their narratives and their records in the same way. So there were people, um, for example, Lord Stanley, um, Alderley Edge. He's no relative, but we we have, you know, some of us think that there is a connection. We need to do some work on that. And they certainly knew each other. So Lord Stanley was one of the most uh, well-known converts. Um, and they obviously knew each other. And I think Robert would have joked about being the poor relatives of, of Lord Stanley and his family. Um, and there were there were quite a number of other um, well-known converts, but all of them, you know, either aristocracy, extremely middle class. And I guess, even though these, these people were fiercely intelligent, you know, they've travelled, which Robert never did. He, was ne he never had that ability or that money to go overseas and travel and explore Islam in the way that Quilliam did. Quilliam came back from, from touring um, various countries and that's when he decided to profess his faith. But he would have spoken to these people, he would have known them. And I guess in society, because they, ha they mainly had the wealth and the time to indulge, you know, finding out about strange exotic religions, they would have been seen as either being quite eccentric um, maybe difficult characters, um, maybe, you know, been seduced by these strange oriental religions um, or stubborn people. But, but you know, we, within their own community, within the Muslim community, incredibly highly regarded, you know, very stable people when you read some of this, and the, you know, the abuse that Lord Stanley, I get quite angry for Lord Stanley, um, some of the abuse that he had to, to put up with from his own family. Um, as we got closer to World War One, the word that was bandied around was traitor. Um, you know, you were disloyal, you were treacherous, you were throwing your lot in with, with the Turks. Um, and obviously, you know, every few years when politics and international politics changes, we have different views about these kind of things. But yeah, I think as a working class person, you would probably just be written off as a bit bonkers. And I think that probably happened to Robert at one stage. But when he did come back to Stale Bridge, this is the interesting bit in his, in his older years, Basically, the town apologised to him for the way that they treated him when he stood up to them and said, I'm not calling a meeting. And they put, put that in the official mm. municipal journal of that year. They said he was proved to be right, which is a big thing for, you know, for town council yes. to admit. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's all this extra as well, extra information. Yeah. I'm just looking at the time because I know we've got another thing that we wanted to do, didn't we, about the books and the questions. And... Yes. So, um. I'll just jump on um, this one that I thought was other in it. Uh, blah, blah. So it was something about friendships, which I thought this was quite pertinent for Interfaith Week. So after the book, did it lead on to further work, <coughs> book writing, friendships, stroke, enemies, etc.? So I thought the friendships and the further book writing might be interesting for Interfaith Week about people connecting to something face yeah i mean i mean the, the interesting bit is through my brother obviously you know um and my brother's a muslim my sister in laws a muslim my nephews are muslims so i've always had kind of you know from my entire la adult life really friends from different faiths anyway um but it's just exploded since we've done the books and uh, and and the the push to write the books were very much mostly from from my muslim friends who kept saying you've got to tell this story and this is amazing you know for for a number of reasons not just the the conversion and the, the the faith journey but the class you know that, that angle as well uh so yeah i mean i just can't even begin to tell you the friends i've made from this from all around the world um just such supportive fantastic people enemy wise <laughs> thanks yeah enemy wise sadly there have been some people that uh, yeah they're basically people who are racist so who, who don't really understand have never met any muslims certainly never been friends with them um and you know they, they tend to sort of look at the whole political side of it and then try and interpret what i've been writing on whatever their political view is of whatever situation is and yeah there, there have been some really nasty people some upsetting people and and it does get you down um but then you know thankfully i've got friends from all these different faith groups now i'll just go and have a moan to them and a rant to them and they just they either sympathize or make you feel better and yeah i mean it, it's just i think that's probably it's a fantastic question because i think if, if robert rashid was around here today i think i think he would just be so pleased by the fact that our family have you know extended these friendships and, and are saying to other people you know it's not even a matter of faith it's just about 
you know, it's Joe Cox's words. You know, it's it's just the commonality of being human. You 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 can watch this and think, well, what a load of rubbish that is. I don't believe I don't believe in God. I don't believe in this. They're all deluded. It's it's causing the world's problems. But just get over that. Come and talk to people. You know, meet people. See see the essence of, of what sparks a belief in something. And if you can only see that as the drive for justice and compassion and fairness, that's a belief that we all have in common. Absolutely, and the social history element of it is really, you know, it covers for everybody, isn't it? It's, all, it's part of all of our, our histories, you know, in Yorkshire, Lancashire, the UK, etc. And like with Interfaith Week, it's just looking at, um, you know, from different angles. So you might not be religious, but it's it's good to sort of understand a bit more about faith, about social justice, about its ties to, you know, social history and the great things that have happened in communities because of that as well. So that's I think the whole the whole point is don't presume that if somebody has a label on them that says I'm this or I'm that, that they will necessarily believe what you think they will. Yeah. You know, it's just see beyond the, any label that we give people. Just get to know the person. Don't don't presume. Never presume. Have a conversation. Have a conversation. Have a Fine. conversation. Yeah, wonderful. Great stuff. So I'm just looking at the time and we've run over a tiny bit. Okay. Maybe we'll see if Nicola wants to pop back in. There are a few Hello. more questions. I'm going to to you as well, Christina, if that's okay. So you Yeah, fine. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, okay, just before we we go today we have a little um competition because chris christine is going to be giving away three of her books signed um so would you like to read the question out chris okay right <laughs> what is the name of the magazine that my dad first saw robert rashid appearing in and that's when we realized he'd converted what is the name of that magazine Okay, uh, that Nicola will tell you who to email with the answer. Th there we go. So that's the email address. So um, the, f the first three people who can correctly answer that and send th your answers to that address there um, will win a signed copy of Chris's book <laughs> from today. <Brilliant>. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, so thank you very much for a really really good session. Thank you, thank you, thank Chris, you. Thank you, <laughs> and. Um, Lovely, and hope you thank can thank you for staying it. with us, everybody. Because I know it's one man's life. There's a lot to say. <laughs> yeah, I hope you can join us for the next writer in residence session, which is on Thursday, the third of December at eleven o'clock, and we'll be having like a wintry festive session. So we will. That. Yeah. <laughs> okay then. Thanks, thank everybody. Thanks, care. everyone. Bye -bye. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.